Every human being is naturally asymmetrical and there's really no way around it. If you're watching this video, you probably are familiar with the concept of the left AIC pattern coined by Postural Restoration Institute. I have a webinar on that concept and that pattern and I will link it down below in the description. So I will spend most of this video discussing how we can go about resolving a left AIC pattern and improving symmetry for those who need it. But if you want more details on the intricacies of it, why we have it and why this asymmetry exists, I would refer you to that webinar as well as the article I am writing alongside creating this video. I'm going to start at the pelvis and then we're going to see on the big skeleton what this looks like and how the pelvis affects it. But the left AIC is essentially this pattern where we have a pelvis that's shifted like so. So the sacrum, this bone right here, is facing the right and we have a pelvis that's more forward on the left and we have more external rotation of this anominate, this big bone right here, and also abduction and flexion of this anominate bone. We have more internal rotation, adduction and extension on this anominate bone. As a result, the femur on the right side eventually compensates into internal rotation and adduction. On the left side, the femur compensates into external rotation as well as abduction. So you're kind of seeing a presentation like so right here. And usually the right hip is in a higher position. In terms of the musculature that gets affected by these joint positions, we're going to have muscles in the backside of the left pelvis that tend to get a little bit tighter because this is closing right here. So we have more of a concentrically oriented or tightened glute max piriformis in terms of the big major players on the backside. And on the front side, we're going to have a little bit more of hip flexor concentric orientation or tightness because this left side is also forward. On the right side, we're going to have a relatively concentrically oriented or tightened oblique on this side, which is helping rotate the pelvis back on that side. We're also going to have more concentrically oriented adductors pulling this femur in right here on the right side. So if we look at this on the big skeleton model right here, if I turn my sacrum and pelvis to the right, that's going to orient my trunk to the right. But our body doesn't want to walk in a circle to the right, so we want to even ourselves out. We also have an asymmetrical diaphragm that allows for us to open up this left chest and turn back to the left, relatively speaking. That's going to depress this right shoulder and it's going to close off this right side and that's going to create more tightness on the anterior front rib cage right here. On the back side, because we are getting pulled like this, this scapula moves closer to the spine, restricting expansion back here on the left side. So from the back, it looks like this and also that. And this is an exaggeration, obviously, but this is where most people start off because of this natural asymmetry. If we look at how this affects the feet, usually the right side has more supination or a higher arch because of this loading of this side. We're over here on this side, so the arch raises up. If you stand up and shift over to the right, you'll feel your arch rise a little bit on that side. Whereas on the left side, it tends to be a little bit more collapsed because we're pushing over to the right side. So we want to flip flop that and we want to be able to sense the inner edge of our heel and foot and first met head right here, ball of the big toe, to help facilitate that push back over to the left, even though this is a left foot. On the left side, what we want to do is we want to sense more lateral border of the heel, and that's going to allow us to, let's say we take a step forward on the left, that will help us start in a position where we can then achieve a nice loading of that side and then push off. But right now on the left side, if someone's in a left AIC pattern, they're usually more prone towards striking the ground, going immediately into that pronation and then push off. If my pelvis is facing the right, you can think of this as a position of right stance when our weight is loaded onto that right side. If we can achieve the ability to push out of that side and accept the weight in our left side, then that will help us fill in those gaps of missing phases of movement or gait. So you can think about this as us needing to go from a position of right stance and then accept that load in left early and mid stance because the left side is constantly forward in a position of relative late stance or pushing back to the right. In terms of musculature that helps us accomplish this, 
we're going to be looking at muscles that orient the pelvis back into this position, but we need to get in positions that allow for that to happen. So if we think about the pelvis here, what's gonna help push our right pelvis more forward into external rotation? That's going to be primarily the glute max and some of the hip abductors on this back side. On the left, we want to pull it into more internal rotation and rotate it back from this forward position. And we can use the AD ductors, the hamstrings that attach back here, and also the left oblique to help pull this down because on the right side, the oblique is already relatively tighter. In terms of the upper body, what we want to do is facilitate musculature that's gonna help pull the scapula back and down. That would be primarily the low trap and also some of the triceps that attaches on this lateral border right here to help downwardly rotate it and pull it back. On the left side, we're going to be looking at muscles that help, after we achieve this expansion, help pull the scap away from the spine. This will be primarily the serratus anterior, but also facilitation of these left obliques will help close this down so that when we breathe in, we can expand what is compressed back here on this left side. We can also test to see if you have this actual underlying left AIC pattern. There's a couple of easy tests you can do, and the ones I'm primarily concerned about are hip flexion, which is a measure of external rotation, straight leg raise, which is a measurement of more internal rotation, and then finally shoulder flexion, which is a measurement of how compressed your scapula is against that back rib cage there. But let's start with hip flexion. Hip flexion requires the ability for external rotation to occur on the active leg beyond about 110 degrees. So if we think about the left AIC pattern, the left side has more external rotation, so we should have relatively better hip flexion on the left side. Within the right side, we have more internal rotation. So we should have a better straight leg raise on that right side, relatively speaking again. And in terms of shoulder flexion, because that back left shoulder is compressed against the rib cage, that's going to restrict the ability for that scapula to glide on the rib cage. Therefore, the right side shoulder flexion should be better. If this is you, then you can do a couple of drills to help fill in the gaps of what you don't have. This is the 90-90 alternating crossover activity. The purpose of this is to recruit the hamstring of the leg that's on the wall and get some nice obliques and abs working with that. So to set up for this, we want to be in a 90-90 position, meaning 90 degrees of bend at both the knee and the hip. And we want to have an object that allows us to keep our knees in line with our toes and our hips. A foam roller can work or a ball or a towel rolled up can also work. So to start with this, we want to have our hands on our low ribs like so. And then feeling the three points of contact of the heel, the ball, the big toe, and the little toe on both feet, he's going to drag his heels down and that's going to allow him to feel hamstrings on both sides. And then Trevor, I want you to extend one leg, your right leg in this instance. And now I want you to take your left arm and reach it for those right toes right there. He should feel way more hamstring on the left than he did before, still focusing on keeping that whole foot flat, but focusing on the heel digging down. Now, Trevor, I want you to exhale nice and gently. Get all that air out, good. Nice open mouth sigh, and he should feel these left obliques or side abs engage. Maintain the compression in these left side abs, not the right, but the left here, of whatever foot's on the wall, and inhale through the nose, keeping that tension there. I should hear him exhale big open mouth sigh is better. And then as he inhales, I should not hear that inhale through the nose. Should be about a five to eight second or longer exhale and about a five second inhale through the nose, focusing on the left hamstring and the left side abs. This is the right side lying left adductor pullback activity. The purpose of this activity is to get some activity working of the adductor and also the abs on the left side to help control internal rotation. 
So to set up, we want to have a perfect 90 degree bend at both our knee and our hip. We want a ball that has a little bit of give to it. So it shouldn't be something that's overly hard, but if you don't have a nice ball that allows you to keep your knees in line with your toes, then a foam roller can work. It's just that a small ball is usually better. To start with this activity, I want you to reach for the wall with your left hand there, Trevor. Good, and he's supporting his head with his right hand. Everything's relaxed at this point. His feet are flat on the wall and he's focused on feeling that lateral border of his left heel, but everything is flat. Now what I want you to do is a slight posterior pelvic tilt. Good, and it's not too much, just a little bit of a tuck under. Now what I want you to do, Trevor, is inhale through your nose, shift this left knee back slightly, exhale through your mouth and push down slightly. We're looking for about a five out of 10 intensity with both the pull back and the push down. This is not a strength exercise, it's very much sensory motor in nature, so it should be pretty relaxed. As he gets a nice full exhale through his mouth, as if he's sighing all that air out of his mouth, he should feel these left obliques engaged. That's what that left reach is helping with. Now, the key here is upon the next inhale, keep these left abs engaged and keep this left knee back, but try to pull it back just a little bit more, just a centimeter or two. And if he can't get that left knee to come back anymore, that's okay. Just having the conscious intention to is really important to help keep recruiting that adductor. And then a nice long exhale after that. Good, we're looking for, for about five to eight second full exhale, making sure that these left abs are engaged. If you're not feeling those left abs, it's probably because you're not exhaling long enough. This is the 90-90 side lying knee toward knee activity. To set up for this, you need some sort of object, a pillow, an Airx pad, a little towel rolled up underneath your bottom side oblique. And that's gonna help you side bend to that side and get a little bit of abs on that side as well when you breathe through this. Secondly, you want your hips and knees bent at a 90 degree angle and you also want this leg in line with the level of the top hip. To start this exercise, give yourself a slight posterior pelvic tilt, nice, and then feel both feet flat on that wall. Now, push this right knee ahead of the left, good, and then turn it up towards the ceiling. We want to feel this reference of the inner edge of the foot on the top foot, and that's gonna help us recruit the glute right here on that top side. Now, as he's holding this position, not losing sense of his arch on the right side in this instance, he's gonna keep this knee pushing into my hand and high, and then lift that left knee to meet it. This is quite challenging, and the hardest part of this exercise is to keep his knee pushing into my hand while lifting the left knee up. Now, if he can't do that and get the left knee all the way up, that's okay, just have the intention to. And if you can only get it a millimeter off of the ground, that's okay. You're still getting the same adaptations from this exercise that we're going for. I would recommend that you start with about three sets of five breaths daily on each of these exercises if you're serious about resolving this and improving your symmetry. But again, not everyone needs these things. Not everyone needs to handle their asymmetry because humans are naturally built for that. So if you don't feel like you have movement limitations that are limiting your ability to do what you want in the gym or in life, then you probably don't need to worry about this that much. But if you do, this might be a good place to start. I would recommend you do these drills and then retest those three assessments to see if you feel a little bit better through them. If you do, that's a great indication that you are getting something out of these exercises and it will most likely carry over to your day-to-day -day life so long as you stay consistent with them.